Back when I was a teenager, my small town got a big lump of money. Most of it was spent on infrastructure, but there was just enough to restore and improve our forgotten park area. Previously, it was mostly some overgrown paths through an unmaintained field, but after the restoration, it was turned into two open fields with paved road joining them. One field was the dog side, with open spaces and plenty of bins for poop bags. The other, larger field, had paved picnic and barbecue spots and a playground. It was dubbed the family side. It was clear that someone put a lot of love into that playground. It was all lizard themed and it was widely popular with the kids. Green lizard swings, lizard slides, a lizard themed jungle gym, all green, all smiles, all adorable. But the whole thing got better by the care that the workers put into it. There were a total of three new maintenance staff workers assigned to what was, unofficially, dubbed Lizzie Park. They were sweethearts who went out of their way to keep the place clean and fun. One of them had the clever idea to sometimes hide candy and sweets inside the mouth of the King Lizard, a large open-mouthed plastic statue at the corner of the swing set. The statue, roughly the size of a crouching adult man, had a little plaque next to it. The smaller the creature, the bolder its spirit. It became a sort of tradition for kids to put their hands in the mouth of the King Lizard to see if any mysterious benefactors had put any candy in there. For good luck, they usually read the plaque out loud first. Kids would gather around the King Lizard in reverence, speak the words like a prayer, and check for candy. Nine times out of ten, there was nothing. But every now and then, someone found a chocolate bar, a few mints, or even a few coins. It was like a tooth fairy thing. Parents would sneak something in every now and then, just to keep the kids busy for a while. The whole thing was really cute, and the kids loved it. Me and my friends were finishing up our final year of high school, so we just saw it as little kid stuff. It wasn't on our radar. Sure, we'd go by Lizzie Park every now and then, but that was mostly because we finally had a space to just meet up and do something. There was plenty of space to grill something and throw a ball around, or blast some music. Just cut loose without anyone bothering you. My friends and I usually met up by one of the paved grill spots across from the playground. We'd say, we'll meet you by the king, and it just became a thing. It worked its way into our way of talking. To be out of school was to be kingside, meaning ready to meet by the king lizard. To finish up homework was to pay tribute. It was all just kind of dumb, but it was our own brand of dumb. One early weekend morning, I was meeting up with my friends to go swimming. I was the first one there, so I just walked around the playground for a while, looking at all the kinds of lizards. Just for the hell of it, I also checked the king lizard for candy. Of course, there wasn't any. Maybe I should have read the plaque first. As a petty act of revenge, I put a few cigarettes in its mouth. Proper adult candy. I sat there for a while as kids came around with their families. They were probably done with their Sunday morning cartoons. The first one of my group to arrive was Jodie, who I'd been crushing pretty hard on for a few months. She would reinvent herself every now and then, changing up her aesthetic and wardrobe. Right now, she was in a punk mood, having shaved her head and wore striking colours with political imagery. It just made me like her more. Jody plopped down next to me, her accessories rattling. I could tell she wouldn't be doing any swimming. We watched the kids play for a while, and I felt kind of dumb about putting the cigarettes in there. Jody wouldn't think it was funny. So, when the kids gathered around the King Lizard and read the plaque out loud, I groaned. Then, the strangest thing happened. They didn't pull out any cigarettes. They pulled out a chocolate bar. I hadn't seen anyone put it there. 
Maybe one of the parents snuck it in when I wasn't paying attention. But I could have sworn I would have seen it. Had it been there all along? And I just kind of missed it. <laughs> That's so nice, smiled Jodie. For a day, that kid is going to be the queen of the playground. Look at that little dork. Jodie was right. Whoever got candy from the King Lizard was royalty. That little gap-toothed girl would be the unquestioned ruler for a day. She'd get to decide what to play, and she'd have a swing all to herself. No one questioned the King Lizard's chosen. Such was playground law. Then, for a brief moment, the kid looked up from her candy bar. Her eyes landed on me from across the field. I could feel her contempt. Somehow, she just knew what I'd done. She knew I'd disgraced the king. As more of my friends rolled in, we all went swimming. As expected, Jody stayed on dry land. Later on, we bought some hot dogs and watched a movie. All in all, just another lazy Sunday. As the sun began to dip beneath the horizon, we once again gathered in the park to say our goodbyes and have a smoke. I was out of cigarettes, having given my last to the King Lizard. You got an extra? Jody asked. You got the best ones. If anyone but Jody had asked, there'd be nothing more to it. But since it was her, I had to at least try something. I excused myself, walked up to the King Lizard, and put my hand on it. Go big, or go home. My cigarettes were still there. I just stared at them, confused. Same brand and everything. Dozens of kids had checked the King Lizard for sweets during the day. How could they have missed this? It didn't make any sense. I just stared into the blank, plastic eyes of the King Lizard for a second. I could feel it judging me, like the gap-toothed girl had done earlier. I hurried back to offer a cigarette to Jodie. What the hell did you... Jodie didn't know what to think, but the others thought it was a neat trick. And that's how I inadvertently started the trend of putting dumb shit in the mouth of the King Lizard. I'd broken a taboo. I'd openly defied King. Jodie just thought I was being childish, and not in the good way. Needless to say, she wasn't particularly impressed. Over the coming weeks, things deteriorated in the playground. Someone got the idea to hide a joint in the mouth of the King Lizard, and the parents were freaking out. They put up a small plastic net in King Lizard's mouth, preventing people from putting things in it. That also meant no more candy. The statue was also vandalised, first with glasses drawn on with a sharpie, but it quickly deteriorated to swastikas and swears. Still, the kids loved the King Lizard, even with no candy and their idol defaced. They gathered around it and read the plaque by heart. I remember vividly how I walked past there one day, seeing a dozen kids gathered around the statue, chanting in unison. The smaller the creature, the bolder its spirit. The smaller the creature, the bolder its spirit. By the time I graduated, King Lizard had been vandalised to the point where they had to take him away. Most of the green paint had been peeled off with knives. The eyes had been spray-painted red, and it had a Hitler moustache. All fingers but the middle one on each hand had been cut off. It looked awful. When they finally hauled it off, kids stopped coming to the park. Some of them dropped by every now and then, but the magic was gone. We even lost the words. Meeting in the park was no longer a meeting by the king. It was just, see you at the park. I couldn't help but feel partly responsible. Maybe my stupid cigarettes gave people the impression that it was okay to mess with it. After all, I'd done it. So why couldn't they? But sadly, that's not where it all ended. If anything, this is where it started. It was an ordinary Tuesday when our neighbour came knocking, asking if we'd seen their son. He was supposed to be visiting a friend, but they'd both gone missing. The kids had run off somewhere on their own without telling anyone. 
People were already out looking for them. I wasn't particularly worried. Those kids knew the back roads of this town better than I did, but I helped out anyway. During our search, it became apparent that other kids had gone missing as well. At least eight other families were out looking, and we were getting frequent calls from worried parents. Everyone was out looking, police and firefighters included, but they were nowhere to be seen. It wasn't until the middle of the day when they suddenly showed up in Lizzie Park. They were just sitting there on the Lizard Jungle Gym, staring at passers-by like a murder of crows. No laughing, no playing, no talking. Just sitting there. And right there, where it was supposed to sit, was King Lizard. They'd brought him out of storage. The statue itself was just hollow plastic. It wasn't that heavy, but dragging that thing half across town took coordination. It looked disgusting, covered in mud and vulgarities. When I got to Lizzie Park, there were already a dozen other people there. No one dared to approach. There was just something... off about those kids. They'd taken off the net from King Lizard's mouth. When the first parents arrived, the kids lunged at them when they got too close. The kids were armed with sticks and shovels, threw sands at those getting too close, and defending their king at all costs. Finally, the gap-toothed girl who I'd seen munching down on a chocolate bar earlier reached into the lizard's mouth. She pulled out a dead rat. With this tribute in hand, she pulled its head off like a screw cap. Once the kids were dispersed and taken home, everyone just collectively decided not to talk about it. It was just a weird kids thing, a game, and no one wanted to look too closely. They were quick to remove the King Lizard again, but found that they had to double up on security. The King Lizard was almost stolen once before after a kid with a fire axe broke the lock. After that, the city decided to just destroy it. I remember that final week of summer. I was moving out of town to study at MSU, and my parents had saved up for a vacation. I got the house for myself. As my parents pulled out of the driveway, I noticed the kid across the street. He was standing by the window, staring at me. I put on a smile and waved at him. The kid held up his hands, twisting them like he was wringing a towel or pulling the head off a dead rat. It was going to be a rough week. Later that night, I woke up to the sound of thumping against my bedroom window. I just fell asleep again, paying it no mind. I checked it out the next morning, only to notice that it had been some kind of furry meat, and that there were bloody splats all over the window. It took me better part of an hour to clean. By now, I was getting a bit paranoid. Every time a kid passed by on the street, it felt like they were staring at me. Every time I met their gaze, my stomach sank. I tried inviting a few friends over to keep me company, but most were busy preparing for college. Some had already left. Hell, Jodie was busy dating someone, and that sucked. The following days, it all escalated. I'd wake up every night hearing things thump against my window. The vandals were, unsurprisingly, kids. I couldn't make out their faces in the dark, and they disappeared into the night as soon as they were out of things to throw. But that was just at night. Someone blew up our mailbox with a firecracker in broad daylight. Water balloons full of soda were thrown at our windows in the middle of the day, attracting all kinds of insects. Whenever I heard someone ringing a bicycle bell outside, I knew some shit had gone down. By Friday night, it felt like I was under siege. The doorbell was ringing over and over, with no one outside. I'd hear knocking at the windows. My bedroom window was pink with dried blood, as I couldn't see the point of cleaning it again. I just locked the house down and waited for my parents to come home, and for all of this to be over. That Friday, I was heating up my dinner when, 
Once again, the doorbell rang. This time, it was different though. It kept ringing, and no one was running away. Still waiting for my lasagna to be heated, I looked outside through the kitchen window. There was only one kid out there, and he wasn't running away. I didn't immediately recognise him, but he was one of the younger ones, no older than six or seven. I opened the door, giving him a stern look. Does your mum know that you're out here pranking people? I asked. You're mean, he said. King Lizard said so. King Lizard said that, huh? I smiled. I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. I'm not that bad, honest. If you want, I could. Suddenly, my body shut down. I was enveloped in this all-consuming, white fire kind of pain that just burst out through my stomach. I'd been fucking stabbed. I want to say I handled it well. There was a four-inch blade ripping up my insides. The entire blade was buried all the way to the hilt. Every breath was pain, and just staying alive was torture. The kid just stood there. Panicked, I pushed him away and shut the door. I noticed my body was having trouble responding, and I had to steady myself against the wall. I hurried back to the kitchen to get my phone, when I realised I wasn't alone. They'd gotten in through the back door. Maybe a window. I could hear someone pulling out drawers in my parents' bedroom, and one kid was standing barefoot on the coffee table in the middle of the living room. It was the gap-toothed girl who'd pulled the head off a dead rat. She had this smile on her face, the same smile when she pulled that chocolate bar out of King Lizard's mouth. She also had a box cutter. I didn't have time to get to the kitchen. I'd be stuck there. Instead, I hurried up the stairs. I could barely move my right leg. It twisted my guts up too much. I hobbled up the stairs, hearing tiny feet tap, tap, tap behind me up the carpet. I threw myself into my room, kicking the door closed. I put my leg up, holding the door closed as a kid tried to get in. I tried to do a sit-up to lock the door. But there was no way. I sort of flopped onto my side, gasping for air. Having steel buried into your guts really makes you realise how little room there is in there. I locked the door, hearing little feet run back and forth. Someone was trying to mess with the lock. I hurried to my computer. I figured my phone was downstairs, but I could still send a message to my friends. I copy-pasted the same thing over and over and just sent it to everyone. Call the police. Someone's in my house. I don't have my phone. I just sent it over and over, spamming it to everyone. That's when I heard something strange. Another set of footsteps, but bigger. Big enough to make the floor creak. A dragging sound and heavy breathing. It sounded like someone dragging a bag up the stairs. It smelled like garbage and burnt plastic. There was a thump at the door, and I could see it buckle. The top hinge was barely hanging on. I had this mental image of the King Lizard banging on the door, accusing me of putting his demise into motion. I could imagine the melted plastic, the white eyes, the cut fingers. I managed to open my bedroom window. I leaned out, trying to scream for help. The first few times, the pain was so bad, I couldn't draw a deep enough breath to scream. I was lightheaded. There was no way they'd hear me. I had an idea. I grabbed the baseball in my top drawer, leaned out as far as I could, and threw it. It went past the hedge and landed flat on the hood of the neighbor's car. Thank God they had a jumpy car alarm. As the alarm started wailing, the bangs were growing louder. I fell to the floor, blood pushing out between my fingers. There was a growl and one more bang at the door. I could hear wood breaking. I just held my breath and closed my eyes, wishing for it all to go away. I'm sorry, I gasped. I didn't mean to. Another bang. Another growl. 
the top hinge broke. One of the kids was laughing. Then, in a snap, it all just stopped. I could hear sirens down the street, and I could see notifications on my computer screen flashing. Someone took my call for help seriously. As the tiny feet disappeared down the stairs, I held my breath, waiting for the big footsteps to follow suit. I never heard them go away, but when the paramedics arrived, there was nothing standing outside. The aftermath was brutal. I had to go through two surgeries and a lot of physiotherapy. My parents had to fly home early. I pointed out the kid who stabbed me and the girl with the box cutter, but the police didn't care that much. They seemed more interested in the adult. I insisted that I'd seen no adult. They were adamant about it though. The back door had been broken by an adult, and the marks on the floor were too large to come from any of the kids. They were no ordinary marks either. It was Ash. Now, this was a long time ago. I'm not sure what happened to the kids who did this to me, but they gotta be in their twenties today. I've tried to put it all out of my mind for years, but the literal scars remain. I've since moved out of town after my time at MSU. I've got a family of my own, but I still can't open the door without taking a deep breath and holding a hand to my stomach. Now, the reason I'm even bringing this insane story up to begin with is something that happened to me the other day. I was picking up the mail when I noticed a small post-it attached to the back of the local paper. The message was simple. The smaller the creature, the bolder its spirit.